Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth day of our Young Innovators Week. My name is Daniela Teuer, and I'm responsible for projects and events at the Veja São Paulo. We are very happy that you are here and that you already have seen a lot of things about the innovation ecosystem and entrepreneurs and uh, the German-Brazilian relations and also Brazil as a market and what the company said about their work on innovation. Today we are talking mostly about funding possibilities and we have lots of very interesting people to talk to you here. And the first one will be Mr. José Renato Lanzi. He is consultant. Sorry, I have to use my glasses. Piera Ciani. It's right? Okay. So, José is industrial engineer and he, as an entrepreneur, has founded two startups. Wow. <laughs> Using government grants so to, to act with his innovation strategy and perhaps that could be a possibility for you too. So, José Renato, please. Good morning, everyone. As uh, was already introduced, my name is Jose Martini. Uh, I'm a consultant in funding here in Brazil for Piracciani, and I'm also a uh, entrepreneur, as most of you here. I, I have two startups, and I'm going to speak a little bit about the, the funding system in here in Brazil and what are the, the possibilities and opportunities here that you can also use if you are located in Brazil or, or you have a company registered in Brazil. I'm going to speak a little bit about our company. We are since 1992 in the, the market of consulting for innovation. And we help more than 350 leading companies. Um, great companies, as you can see, Ambevi, which is a, a, one of the big companies here in Brazil, Cartil. You, you can see a lot of companies that we, we've worked with and helped them with the, their front funding and innovation strategy. We have a team of uh, experts in innovation and management. So this is our, our focus. Is management through innovation and we work in three main verticals which is consulting education and funding uh, is what to do how to do and the money to do it I'm mostly focused on funding so my, my expertise is, is in funding uh, they already told me about my professional background I'm an industrial engineer I am also an entrepreneur and I use fundings uh, or to help my clients and also for my, my company as well. So uh, I have cases that uh, can help you also raise money for, for funding. And this is the Brazilian ecosystem. I think I'm gonna do it seated because I have to, to be passing it, it's easier. So we have uh, several, several kinds of funding here in Brazil. So from low ones, grants, human resource, risk capital, uh, indirect funding, uh, fiscal incentives, and we are mostly focused on grants and human resource today because uh, when, you talk, when, when, you say, when you talk about uh, entrepreneurship and, and startups, we, we're talking about raising seed capital or pre-seed capital. And this is uh, what we're going we're gonna to speak about today. First of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, walk you across the, the grants, the most important grants that we have here in Brazil for uh, both uh, researchers and for companies. Uh, these are the, the main funding agencies in Brazil. So it's FINEP, MRAP, CNPQ, and BNDAS. Uh, the first one is the most important one, which, which we have the, the, the more, uh, more money coming from and where you can find more funding for startups and for companies, established companies as well. Uh, FINEP uh, is, a, is a funding agency, is a federal funding agency. 
uh, they, they launch calls for proposals every two or three months, and they are mostly thematic. So we have, uh, last year we had, for example, Industry 4.0, which was one of the most competitive uh, call for proposals in Brazil in the last 10 years. Uh, we also had co COVID uh, strategies for uh, COVID technologies to, to, to fight COVID. We also have some, some calls for automotive industries. Uh, normally they support the development from technology readiness level from three to seven, which is from proof of concept to validation in the, into the customers, more or less. Uh, the average ticket for this, this kind of funding is from 1 million reais to 3 million reais per project. And this is the best thing you can, you can find, the best money you can find for, for, uh, for innovation here in Brazil because they pay mostly everything that you need for, for your, your project. So from labor to third party services, consumables, equipment, travel expenses, everything you need for your project, you can, you can, it can be funded by, through these programs. Now they have some, some calls open. Uh, the first one is the HOTA 2030. Uh, they give us um, up to 3 million reais to, for the, the automotive industry supply chain. So either you're uh, a, a first tier or second tier, it, it doesn't matter. You just, uh, you, you have to have an innovative, innovative project. Uh, we also have water for Brazilian semi-arid. Uh, up to three million reais as well for uh, water access in Brazil and on Northeast. Uh, technologies for monetizing pre-salt layer in, in, in a natural gas. Uh, they have an, a limit of 15 million for all the projects, so they, they're gonna choose projects uh, within the, the limit of 15 million. And they have this AI startups, which is a very interesting right now. Uh, it's a eight, 80 million reais for in, in four areas, health, agriculture, industry, and smart cities and they give up to three million depending on the size of the company, uh, and it, but it requires a co-investor for this project, for, for this program in, in specific. They also have some recurrent calls. Every year they, they, they run these calls. So the first one is Espaço Finapi. The, the deadline just uh, ended two, two weeks ago. Uh, it's a startup competition. They, they can give you up to uh, 150K AIs for 12 accelerated startups. They also have this innovative women prize, uh, 120K AIs for 15 startups funded by women. And the FinApp startup, uh, which is an investment, so it's uh, equity uh, with a convertible bond for 1.2 million AIs. Another interesting program here in Brazil is Embrapi. Embrapi is also a federal uh, institute. Uh, you can develop a project uh, with the help of a tech, a tech center. So it, you have to use a certified tech center they, they have some in several areas, for, for example, uh, biotech or uh, artificial intelligence or, or even logistics. You have several, several tech centers that you can use to, to help you develop your, your, your project. Uh, the project can be submitted at any time. It usually supports TRL from three to seven, the most, uh, so proof of concept to, uh, to validation in the clients or uh, an MVP. Uh, the government fund pays one third of the project, and you can share with Sebrae uh, so, sometimes uh, two thirds of the project. It, it depends on on the on the, how much Sebrae has and how, how is the, the the agreement from Sebrae and, and your company to uh, and other companies also. Have, you can you can use another part, partner to to uh, to fund this project as well. The average ticket is one million reais, but it, it, there's no limit, so you, you can it, it can be less, it can be more. But the average ticket of a, of a, pro, a project would be more or less one million reais, and the eligible, eligible expenses is only expenditures with the technology development within the center. So it's all the, the, the cost that the center has to develop the technology for you. Uh, we have also some grants. The CNPQ is uh, one of the our our funding agencies for for researchers. So uh, they, from time to time, they, they, they launch this, this call for proposal called Human Resources for Strategic Areas. And it depends on a call of proposal, so it's not open all, uh, all year round. Uh, the last one was in October last year. They had 43 million uh, reais for, for, the whole pro, for the whole program. And they support R&D projects on several strategic themes. They had a list of strategic themes that they, they, they are supporting and they gave up to 200K for, uh, for startups and 400K for established companies. 
the, the point here, the eligible expenses is only the research grants. So they have only money for, to pay for the labor, not for consumables or anything else. VNDES is usually a bank. It's a development bank here in Brazil, but they have some, uh, some um, initiatives in, in the, the ecosystem. The last one is the Garage in BND, uh, BNDES. Uh, they have a call open right now. Uh, it's, an, it's rather an acceleration program than a, a grant, but you, you can have this money to use whatever you want in your startup. And uh, the price is 2K highs for the creation proposals and 3K highs for the, the traction proposals. It depends on the, on the, the, the stage you are on, on your startup. Uh, the point here is that only one startup earns the, first, the, 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 the price for the, the creation proposal and the traction proposal. Uh, we also have the Centella. Uh, they're now uh, launching, launching the, the second, the second pro uh, call for proposal right now. Uh, it's a federal program coordinated by the state agencies. Uh, it's early stage support, so if you have an early stage uh, uh, startup, it, it's good for you. They give up to 5K, 50K Brazilian highs to develop the idea. Uh, you don't need to have a registered company to, to apply for the, the, the program. And there are some states that, are, that, that have the, the, the call open right now, which are Bahia, Mato Grosso, Paraná, Pará, Rio Grande do Sul, Piauí, and Minas. So you have to be in, this, in these states in order to, to apply for the program. Sao Paulo has already closed. Other program that we had last year, which, is, which, which was very important for the ecosystem as well, is the Catalisa ICT. ICT means uh, Innovate, uh, Institute for, for Science and Technology. Uh, it's, a, it's a program from Sebrae as well. Uh, they, they have the entrepreneurship education plus grants for the development of projects. Let's call they, they gave uh, 130K for, to pay for researchers, grants for researchers, and two, uh, 20K to, to cover other expenses such as consumables or, or services. And 250 projects were, 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 were approved in this, this project. And they are promising in the next call in September. They're, they said something about 450K, uh, but we, we still don't have any, any information because the, the call wasn't launched yet. Maybe she can talk a little bit if she has some information about it. Uh, and this is the, the last program that I, I like the most. It's from PAPESP. It's uh, for, for companies located in, in Sao Paulo, for researchers located in Sao Paulo. It's based on the SBIR program from the National Science Foundation in the, the United States. Uh, it's open for companies for up to 250 employees. They need to be based in Sao Paulo. And it comprises three phases. The first phase is the proof of concept, and it's up to 300 KHIs for the proof of concept. The phase two, it's up to 1 million KHIs for scale up or applied research so that you, you can really develop your, your product. And the phase three is uh, up to one million highs as well for commercial development, but this requires a request for proposal. It's not open all year, all year round. Only phase one and phase two are open every, uh, at all times. You can pay for grants for researchers, consumables, third part services, equipment for phase two only. So if you need some kind of equipment, it's only for phase two. They might provide you some, some equipment in phase one, but you have to justify it. So normally they, they don't provide you with uh, equipment and travel expenses for field research as well. So it, is, it, it comprises pretty much what, what you need. The problem here is that they don't pay uh, salaries, they only pay grants, and the grants are not very high. So the, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's already established, the, the, the value for the grants, they're not very high, so they're not very attractive to, for you to, to hire new, new employees. But uh, you, can, you can use it for, for your program as well. And there are some other special programs that they, they, they launch sometimes. Uh, the Sebrae Plus FAPESP, uh, which is a, uh, it's a program for phase two direct. And then you can also hire some people for, for the commercial development as well. And the Pipi Emprendedor, which is an acceleration program based on the I-Corps from the National Science Foundation as well. And the Pipi Invest, where you can find another investor and then FAPESP will put the same amount of money that the investor put in your, in your project, as long as you have a, a a, a running PP uh, at, the, at that time. And uh, I'm going to talk about also uh, an interesting uh, pro program here in Brazil, which is called Innova Talentos. It's a, a program for HR, where you can hire highly, highly qualified personnel 
for your for your project but you don't have labor taxes or any kind of employment relationship this means that you don't have no termination you, you don't have termination fee and then you, you can save up to 50 percent of the, the the money from from the from hiring these these professionals you can have a project for up to two years and uh the the cni which is the, the brazilian confederation of the industry can help you with the selection and hiring of these professionals so uh, last but not least uh, i'm going to talk to you how can we help you if you need our help and i'm going to be here later and we can talk a little bit about it and how, how can we help you to to uh, raise this money uh, we have a highly qualified team for these incentives so low ones grants and taxes as well we can help you with the, the screening and selection of high potential product let's imagine you have more than one idea that you, you want to, to select we can help you with that uh, we can introduce you to technological partners with specific capabilities that maybe you don't have in your in your startup uh, we can help you elaborate uh, the project according to the agency requirements, all the documental uh, diligence that is needed to, because you have to have the, all this, uh, this document proving that you are able to, to, to get the grant. Uh, we can help you with accountability, interaction with the agency, and supporting during the contract as well with the agency. So uh, this is pretty much what I had to talk. Uh, I think that there are going to be uh, a doubt session later, so Q&A. And thank you very much. So thank you very much, Renato. That was a very interesting overview. We will have some of the people of the institutions mentioned here giving more details later on. Today we have 10 speakers giving input to you and being here to give you answers to some questions I hope you will have. So now I want to invite Professor Dr. Lilian Carecci from Ausping and Fea Uspi to give her speech on fundraising about venture capital and angel investment. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome Lilian. Lilian is professor at FEA USP and USP Innovation Agency Executive and member of the management team of FEA, the master program in entrepreneurship. And is a startup's financial advisor and angel investor herself. Welcome, Lilian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Hi. So Hi. nice to be here with you. Uh, so. Um, yeah, this is my presentation, but it's very important for you to understand how Brazilian uh, financing ecosystem is organized. So we have already uh, developed a lot in grant program, but we are still constructing, building our risk capital ecosystem. So the early, the early stage investment, this is what I'm going to talk about, is just beginning. So we are trying to build it. Be at USP, uh, we, are, we are building the connection to the early stage investment. And still, this ecosystem is in construction. We have today approximately 20 angel investors association in Brazil. If we compare to the United States, there are more there, there are more than 100 angel investment associations. And why angel investment associations is important? Because they practice the best uh, way to invest in a startup. So they implement the best practice. So we are working indeed together with this angel investment association, creating the best practice here in Brazil. So we are just beginning. Um, we achieved the total amount of 1 billion reais in investment, what is $200 million in angel investment. And why we need this? Because the grant capital takes the startup until a stage, and they need to achieve risk capital to expand and scale the operations. Uh, so this is 
we have still a very small uh, early stage investment in Brazil. After the angel investments, we have the venture capital. And here it's a very whole different history because the venture capital is a professional investor and it, and it takes investment from limited partners, which are other investors. They take their money and they have to implement a very strict procedure to take the decision and then to uh, invest in a startup. So, if we have a very close relationship with angel investors, which are persons and not an institution, not a vehicle of investment, it's much easier for, us, for an entrepreneur to have access to the risk capital industry. So I, bring, I brought here my presentation uh, and to show you how we are building this. So I came from the finance industry. So I used to work with valuation, I used to work with finance structuring, and then we started to have to develop entrepreneur here in the university. And I started to teach an, a, a entrepreneurial finance to our entrepreneurs and to uh, executives that work in innovation in industry. And we start to understand that Brazil were very focused on grant program, and our entrepreneurs were very focused on grant program, which are great, but it's not enough. It's, it's not enough. So we built an uh, executive program uh, here, uh, where we teach and we educate entrepreneurs how to play the game with risky capital, and we teach the angel investors how to decide, implement the best practice to invest in these startups. And in this executive program, we prepare both of them separately in two different uh, journeys, and then we put them together. And this is what I am testing right now. If we prepare entrepreneurs, if we prepare investors, because we don't know what the best practice here in Brazil. We don't even have a manual of best practice. There are terrible histories about uh, agreement between angel investors and entrepreneurs. So we are just, we are heavy, we have a blank page where we can build it. Uh, so what we are doing, okay. yes, yeah. so what we have to understand uh, right now is that the angel investments which have, is all right, 10 minutes? <gasps> okay, so we have um, the angel investors that they will decide about their own savings if they want to invest in our project. The decision will be made upon a confidence uh, factor. So the decision, the investment will not, happen, uh, will not happen after a pitch. We have, you have to build this confidence relationship with the angel investor. And what you should aim in this relationship it's not just the money, but it's the smart money. It's the knowledge of this person that can bring to you the connections that this person can bring to you. If money could solve everything, every setup that achieve or receive money from, from venture capital would achieve the success. And it's not enough. So it's not enough. So you or we as entrepreneurs, we should establish relationship with potential investment since the idealization or since the prototype, since the beginning of our project. Okay? So if we know that we are going to increase our chance to achieve capital risk investments. 
Uh, but the journey do doesn't stop there. We have to understand that you have a whole journey to go. And that this is a ten, approximately 10 year journey. 10 year journey. It's not, uh, it does not end in the grant program. It does not end in the angel investment. And it, does, and it does not end in the venture capital. Because we have the venture capital, a whole journey of pre-seed, seed, series A, series B, series C, and the series J, whatever your history will be. But this journey will end in an exit. And it's not the end of your history with the startup. The exit is where the investors liquidate their positions. They will realize their return. They will concrete their return. And th this is the point where you are going to put the money in your pocket. So being an entrepreneur is a very an exercise of a lot of patience. Because probably you're going to take 10 years for you to put money of what you built all over this 10 year history. Uh, and this is a model that I am, I built I, uh, about how is the economic uh, history or economic model for a startup to achieve capital risk. So what is expected from you is that you should increase your valuation and, of course, your sales in three times, three times in the first three years, and then two times, two times, two times. This is the numbers that you probably have heard up to now. This is for a meaning. Because the investor that enters here in the early stage, he, he expects at least 50% per annum of return. And you have to increase more because of the, the dilution uh, participation of the investors that it will dilute and your participation will dilute too all over this journey. So you have to increase and to expand your activities uh, very aggressively for you to achieve and for you to enter in this game. And it's feasible. Of course, in the last year, we have been, investors are, are questioning how much you can increase and how much money you should burn. But the history will not change. It's going to be asked from you, entrepreneur, for you to increase very aggressively, probably, Three, three, two, 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 one, or two, two, two. Does not matter how long or how much you're going to increase, but it's going. You are going to be required to increase and to expand your activities very, very much. But it, it should not fear you, entrepreneur, because you are you are having a great idea. You are identifying a very important opportunity. So you shouldn't be intimidated for this aggressive increasing requirement. For you to understand this, uh, this game, you should understand the stages of the investment decision. And you should know that this, uh, the investment thesis of a venture capital or of an angel investor, it depends from it, uh, its perception or its view of the market. But you should enter in the deal flow of the investor. The investor will screen and will select you and will analyze you. And he will be very close to you, giving mentoring to you before the investment decision comes. So you have to understand that the investment will not happen based on your presentation, but it will happen based on the trust is going to increase from uh, the mentoring or from the relationship with you. This is very important. So it's a history, it's a relationship, it's a connection history. 
that's why uh, we are believing that we should increase and we should create a very important or a very big network between entrepreneurs and investors. And this network should have a very structured information for you, for us, to achieve a minimization of information asymmetry, as we don't have a regulator to control the activities and to control the operations. So what we have here, uh, what I'm proposing right now, is, to, is for us to have a platform where we can connect entrepreneurs and investors. And investors and venture capital. And the investor can take you to the next step of the fundraising journey. And the investors can present you to venture capital. But for you to achieve the end investor, you should have first been introduced to him and should have a match between the investment tests of the end investor and your business model. This is the first factor, the, ver the first variable that promotes the connection. And then we start the relationship partnership through a mentoring. And this mentoring can achieve, can take you to, the, to your first investment. The mentoring should start, should start before the grant pr program. The mentoring should start when you are just having the idea of creating a startup. You should talk to a lot of persons. You should talk to the most number of people that can give you their different views from what you are trying to solve, from what the problem that you are trying to, to solve. As more people you talk, the best picture of the problem you can take and the best solution you can bring it. So what we should, what I'm seeing now is that for us to create more opportunities for entrepreneurs to achieve investments is to create this platform of connections, to create more opportunities of connections. So this is the end of my work today, and this is what I'm fighting, and I'm waking every morning to, to solve here in the university and in our country. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lillian. That was a really interesting input, information. The importance of trust. I think everyone will see that that's really, really a good point. So now, I will invite Silvia Romanelli from uh, Invest Sao Paulo to talk about the Sao Paulo state as entrepreneurial ecosystem ready for business. So Silvia works as innovation advisor at Invest SP. That is the investment and competitiveness promotion agency of the state government of Sao Paulo. She currently leads projects in the front of internationalization of startups, such as the SP Global program, and she also supports the Department for Economic Development of the State of Sao Paulo in mapping opportunities for international collaboration in science, technology, and innovation. So, Silvia, welcome. The stage is yours. Hello, guten Morgen. <laughs> I hope my Deutsch is not that bad. <laughs> Bom dia. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I've heard, uh, is, it, is it working? Okay. I've heard you're having a very intense week. And so far, um, I hope you are convinced that Brazil is a good market. But uh, what, I, what I'll try to do uh, this morning is trying to convince you 
uh, why Sao Paulo should be like your target market in Brazil. So as Daniela uh, introduced, um, I'm an innovation advisor at InvestSV. And although the name suggests we do not invest directly in companies, uh, rather our mission is to uh, promote and create a friendly business environment um, in the state of Sao Paulo and uh, also to attract foreign investors uh, to do business here in this state. Um, so I'm going to showcase a, a video that can um, summarize a lot of the overview I want you to, to I want you to have about Sao Paulo. Let's see if it works. Um, if not, then So why don't we wait um, on the video to work? Please, Mars, you hold the time. <laughs> uh, no, but just kidding. Uh, so the state of Sao Paulo has more than uh, 45 million of inhabitants, and that's a huge domestic market. And that's just the state of Sao Paulo. This is one of the reasons why our local startups are not that active in the international market, because they already are, they are very comfortable with the internal market they have. But that's also the opportunity for foreign entrepreneurs to, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, more innovative solutions also um, to tackle this, uh, this huge uh, internal market. Um, see? Yeah. São Paulo, Brazil. São Paulo is movement. Transformation. Work. São Paulo is progress. Safe growth. 704,000 new jobs, January to August 2021. 32% of jobs in Brazil. GDP growth forecast, 2021, 7.5%. Higher than Brazil's forecast, 5.3%. And the world's, 6%. Sao Paulo is reliability. It's leadership in agribusiness. Sao Paulo is respect for the environment. Respect towards the Paris Agreement and sustainable development. UN commitments, race to zero and race to resilience. New Rio Pinheiros, the largest social and environmental work in Latin America. 46 million people. Diversity, quality of life, San Paolo is science, Butantan Institute, the largest vaccine producer in Latin America, research, technology, 
innovation. Sao Paulo represents the biggest privatization and concession program in the country. 12 PPPs and concession projects carried out. 20 more in progress. Investments of US $10 billion. South America's largest airport, San Paolo International Airport. The best 18 highways and the first zero carbon highway of Brazil. A good future for new investments. San Paolo has the largest port complex in Latin America. Besides the biggest exhibition and convention center of Latin America, Sao Paulo has experience in hosting major international music and sporting events. The largest site of technical schools and home to four out of the ten best universities in Latin America. Sao Paulo thinks about the future. Sao Paulo has the strength of good businesses and profitable returns. Sao Paulo receives you with one of the most favorable business-friendly environments in the world. Sao Paulo, a nation within a nation. Ready for business. So, so as we, as you can see, we say it's a nation within a nation because it is the wealthiest uh, state and uh, the, the financial part uh, of Brazil, and that's why uh, most of the uh, of the companies have, like foreign companies, have their headquarters here. So, as the video already summarized, I'm just I'm just gonna some of the of the info so as we saw um, it's a very a huge consumer market um, home to 60% uh, of uh, Fortune Latin uh, uh, companies that have their headquarters here. Um, it goes without saying that, um, that uh, the projection of economic growth uh, is one of the highest, highest in Brazil. In terms of competitiveness ranking, Sao Paulo uh, ranks uh, first compared to other states. Um, and now more linked to our conversation here today. Um, that's also the state that invests the most in R&D and has um, some of the best universities in uh, Latin America. But I wanna talk about the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we do have some, uh, um, some verticals, some sectors that are really uh, booming uh, at the moment. And those are verticals in which Sao Paulo is, is very strong and has really mature uh, startups and this is, a, this is an ongoing process. We have seen the, uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Brazil getting uh, even more mature. Um, nowadays it's the most mature in Brazil, but it's a still uh, a process. But so far we can see that um, we are really uh, doing well in retail, fintech, um, health, um, Agritech, of course, also because of the of of being a very important and big uh, cluster in this state. And I want to I want to highlight as well. Um, this is not even updated, but we have seen a boom in, in unicorns in Brazil, and most of them based in São Paulo. And one thing that I find very impressive is this, this info about uh, the year of 2019. 
in which we can see that the, just the state of Sao Paulo received more uh, investment, the startups from the state of Sao Paulo received more investment than other uh, countries in Latin America. So this is a really very uh, uh, big uh, flux of investment that's coming in and uh, a lot of opportunities that are rising and I want to highlight also all the uh, all the sectors related to ESG. So ESG uh, that states for environmental, social and governance issues has been really a, a hot topic um, or I guess for all countries at the moment, but especially for Sao Paulo. You could see from the video that Sao Paulo committed to, uh, to U uh, UN campaigns on race to zero, race to resilience, and it is really taking it very seriously. So the state has been working on a framework to, um, to select and, um, and uh, evaluate projects that fits into ESG um, segments. So they are really putting uh, the attention and investment on those sectors. So a, a great opportunity for clean tech, um, eco design, uh, renewable energies, and all, all verticals related to it. Now talking about what Invest can, can offer to you. Um, we do have uh, different, uh, thank you, different fronts. Um, as the Investment and Competitiveness Promotion Agency, we, are, uh, we offer as a free service um, uh, advisory on any topic you might have when thinking about investing and doing business in Sao Paulo. So whether your business needs some advice on, on where in the state to be established or uh, in which cluster you should be um, you should be locating your business or some connections with tech parks, with incubators, accelerators, um, or even if your business requires an environmental license. So this is all uh, services that investors can offer to you. Um, we also have international offices. We have four at the moment, including one in Munich, not so far from Marienplatz. Um, so it is a, 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 um, an entry point, uh, not just for companies from the state of Sao Paulo who want to get connected to Germany and Europe, but also to you as, as uh, German entrepreneurs that want to get connected and you're very welcome uh, to visit uh, the office there. And um, we do have some other um, international offices. And despite the fact that I mentioned that we are nowadays the most mature entrepreneurial startup ecosystem in Brazil, we also realized we needed more public policies to foster our local startups, Brazilian startups, startups from Sao Paulo State. We needed to help them and support them in their internationalization efforts. That's why we created uh, the SP Global Program. So this one is focused on, on the Brazilian uh, entrepreneurs in the room. It's a program um, that uh, gives you training and also um, help you to get connected and explore international markets with our support. It's an initiative of the State Secretariat for Economic Development promoted by InvestSP. For this current edition, we're focusing on those verticals and the European market, having uh, Germany as, a, as one of the target markets. And next week, we're hosting a webinar for Brazilian startups on opportunities to, be, to do business um, abroad in Europe. Uh, Gloria, who will be speaking later today, will also uh, participate. Um, so I, I can give you more information uh, during the, the break give you a moment to, um, to access the description stage. <laughs> and I strongly suggest that you follow InvestSP uh, social uh, medias because we're, we're uh, very oftenly organizing uh, programs also to host foreign entrepreneurs in Sao Paulo. 
that's the case of the Global Scale Up program we organized uh, last year together with more nine countries and this was a program, a global program. We hosted four entrepreneurs virtually in an immersion week in Sao Paulo with a lot of the content you're also getting this week. Um, it was based on challenges that the UN set for the COP26 last year and it was internationally awarded uh, programming that we are organizing again this year. So for uh, was the, our delegation in, uh, in Glasgow, in Scotland last year. And we are organizing it again this year. So for German and Brazilian entrepreneurs, if you have solutions that are somehow addressing um, mainly those two challenges about adaptation, green growth, uh, resi uh, um, environmental resilience, and also if you have, if your solution may solve um, challenges related to green pro public procurement, this is, the, this is the program for you. It's open uh, to, to all startups. Um, the, the deadline for applications is, is the 6th of June, so let's pay attention on that. And I strongly suggest that you keep assessing our networks because we are uh, very frequently working with other um, global innovation programs that are accessible to all of you. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, present to you Sebrae for Startups. Uh, first of all, I will introduce myself. So I'm Juliane Slaviero. I'm head of marketing at Sebrae for Startups. And my career is based on communications and marketing. And now I'm responsible for uh, improve Sebrae for Startups brand in the market. But first of all, have you ever heard about Sebrae? I think everybody knows about Sebrae. What is Sebrae? Uh, I, will, I will introduce Sebrae. Uh, my, my colleagues presented and mentioned about Sebrae, but Sebrae is the Brazilian micro and small business service that helps all the little entrepreneurship, uh, how to improve it, and offering programs, uh, services, but the main target is the, the traditional business. And we, we have all this expertise in entrepreneurship, but now we realize that it was a good opportunity to, to focus only on startups. That was the reason that we launched the new brand, Sebrae for Startups. Uh, this brand, brand is dedicated on startups ecosystem uh, based on Sao Paulo, because Sebrae is a national uh, service, a non-profit service, but also there is uh, local offices to, to improve entrepreneurship here in Brazil. And Sebrae for Startups is an exclusive brand from Sao Paulo State. Uh, I won't repeat, as Silvia said, Sao Paulo is a great place to, to invest and to found a, a startup or to get investments here, but we are focused on, uh, we are the, the, the largest 
open innovation program here in Sao Paulo. And we are focused to, to improve and to promote a sustainable uh, growth of the startups. On the other hand, we are concerned, we are, we are, uh, so, so we want to, to improve the ecosystem here in Sao Paulo and we want to transform Sao Paulo as a hub, a, a global hub of innovation. And as Silvia said, Sao Paulo has great reasons to, to, to invest here. Uh, we have five uh, verticals. The first of all, uh, first of all, is to to improve uh, scientific scientific innovation with uh, deep techs, hard techs, uh, resources. Uh, we also improve to to get market access. Uh, so if you have a startup or if you want to introduce your your service in the market, we have a, a program to help you. Uh, we want to improve innovation communities because Sao Paulo has, not only in the Sao Paulo city, but outside Sao Paulo, there's a, there are a lot of communities, good communities to, uh, about innovation. Uh, capital access, because I know all of entrepreneur has the, the, this challenge to get uh, investments or capital access, and also scale up international expansion. Uh, next couple of years, uh, next couple of weeks, we want, we will go to to London with Invest SP uh, to present the ecosystem, the local ecosystem, but also to to present some opportunities to get investors or new markets or global internationalization. Uh, here's the all uh, a little bit of our programs. We have more than 30 programs in our portfolio. But we have programs since the idea from the scale up moment. So if you have an idea and you don't know how to, to begin a startup or how to find found a startup, we have a, a program to help you. Um, if you want to develop your research or to get sources to, to improve your research, we have a program to help you. Uh, if you if you want to, to, to get your sales machine in the market have a program to help you. And if you want uh, capital access or scale up, if you want to scale up, we have a program to help you. Sebrae has a lot of programs uh, from all kinds of startups. Deep techs, hard techs, fintechs, and also economic creative. And let me see numbers. Uh, we have $70 million from, past, from next four years and more than 30 programs, exclusives for st startups based on Sao Paulo State. Uh, we, we've helped with five 5,000 hours mentorship, uh, more than 20, 20 partnerships. As you can see, financial partnerships, uh, health partnerships, uh, resources partnerships, and we helped more, more than 500 startups. Uh, here's our, our QR code from our website, and we can help. You can see more about our programs, our events, and I invite you to to find to to follow us in the, our social media as LinkedIn. And if you want to to know more about, I will. Uh, we can talk more in Q and A moment. Okay, so thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Now we go to the questions and answers session. Um, we will have some 10 minutes for that, and afterwards we go to our coffee break, okay? So please, does anyone have a question here? I have one. Uh, it's like the, the same as always, <laughs> but... Uh, 
For Professor Lillian, I have a question for you. When do we, when do we as startups, know that it's time for angel investing? Mm. Great, Rafael. Uh, look, this is as soon as you have something, that your concept of your idea. It's enough for you to attract a person to invest in your stuff. Okay? But pay attention. The earlier uh, he invests in your startup, the more participation you are going to sell to him. So, you have to manage your cap table. And cap table means your participation. So, there are some rules of thumb that uh, you have to know. In the Serie A, the uh, entrepreneur or the f founders should have at least 65% of participation in your startup. So, if you sell 30% right in the beginning for an angel investor, you are killing your chance to go ahead in the fundraising journey. Okay? This is not a point for you to find uh, or the right moment to invite an angel investor. Look, you shouldn't uh, focus on the money, but you should focus on a person that will help you and take your hand and take you, or go with you, this journey of fundraising. This is very important for you. And success financing shouldn't be uh, something that you are just with the water over your face. It should be a strategy for you. So you should prepare your startup to go ahead with or without a risky capital investor should be an option. So, you can fly alone, but if you have someone to go together with you, you can fly higher. You understand? Okay, so, prepare your business to go alone. And then, you probably will attract more investors that want to go with you. And you have option to decide who you want to go with you. Because an angel investor or a venture capital can be a help for you if you won't decide, if you cannot have the option to decide. And what you should look for, depending on your startup team, you should need look for compet competences, abilities that you don't, you don't have in your founder team. So you should recognize what you need and then look for this competence uh, from the angel investor, for example. You understand? So thank you very much, Lillian. Uh, as you see, it's like any kind of relationship. Huh? Be prepared to fly alone, and then with someone else you can fly higher, but if it's not the right person, it would be helpful for you. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, another question, please. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. The, yes. Um, you said that FINEF is the best option for grant, right? Can you talk a little bit more? Because in our, in our case, we're going to pre-incubation in Cietec. And the guy was saying for us that we should aim for PPFAPESP. And I didn't hear about FINEP at first. So I wanted to, you to talk a little bit more the differences between FINEP and PPFAPESP. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what I mentioned is the best is that uh, they, they provide you with all, all the, the expenses that you need within your, your, your project. So they pay, they pay for salaries as well. And PP doesn't. But for a startup, I would rather recommend going for PP, which is uh, uh, it's uh, not, not easier, but it's open uh, all year round, and then you can you can submit a project at, at any time, and uh, you can <clears throat> you can also have interactions with them. 
So if your project is, is denied, you can go, go, go again and try again and, and uh, remote your project to, to make it, it work. So it's better for a startup to start with PIPE. What I mentioned is that uh, FINEPE is the, uh, the, the best money to get because it's, uh, it's also non-refundable, so it's a grant. And you can, yeah, it's flexible yeah, and, you can, and you can pay for salaries as well. So it's better for, to, to be attractive for uh, if you need to hire new people for your startup. That's, that's why I mentioned it. So I, I have more than a question. So for, for Renato, José Renato uh, as well, one of them. Uh, so you talk about this past FINEP as a program. I want to know if this is a program uh, that uh, uh, to that, uh, to the German startups can apply as well, and uh, the almost the same question to uh, Silvia and uh, to Juliana, uh, uh, Invest São Paulo and uh, Sebrae, if uh, the German, what services you can offer directly to to the German startups if they come to Brazil to São Paulo, facilities, tutorial, and so on. And uh, I, I want that you talk a little more about the office in, in Munich. What service you offer there? Thank you. Okay, thank you for your question. Uh, usually, the the FNAP only supports companies that are established in Brazil. So, although they, they may be foreigners, uh, founders, you have to be established in Brazil. So you have you have to have a legal uh, a legal registration here in Brazil in order to to apply for the, the programs. So about the services that uh, okay ah makes sense. <laughs> so about the services that Invest SP offers that are uh, open and accessible to um, German entrepreneurs. So first of first of all, um, if you have any questions about uh, infrastructure in this state, about uh, public tech parks and incubators, also where to establish, depending on your business, which cluster would be more uh, suitable. So any questions you might have about the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Sao Paulo, we offer uh, like free advice, and uh, we will uh, we will. Um, have a call and discuss, understand uh, your business in order to most probably indicate some some ways. Um, so for the for the innovation programs, the one that is open to German startups is the Global Scale Up Programming. That it's the global program I mentioned for COP. Um, so it's now and we will offer for the startup selected um, an immersion uh, week uh, virtually in Sao Paulo. And also in all the, all the nine, no, 12 countries involved this year. Um, and about the office in Munich, um, it's um, uh, the, the, the international offices, they work as a, with a membership model. So if you are a company uh, from Sao Paulo and you want to do business in Germany and Europe uh, and you want to get the support of the state of Sao Paulo, you can uh, become a member, an associated member of the international offices, in this case, the, the German office, and you can get uh, customized uh, uh, reports on uh, some studies, some market reports, uh, some, some connections. It's really tailor-made based on your needs, uh, but it's also um, an entry point and a, and a contact for German companies uh, who want to get connected to Sao Paulo. So it's also a focal point abroad for German entrepreneurs who want to get connected with institutions here in this state. About Sebrae, about Sebrae uh, for German entrepreneurs or uh, students, uh, we have a program for, for beginners. Uh, if you want, if you need to, to, to know how to transform your idea to become a startup, we can help you. And also, we can get some uh, matchmakings with for hires. And uh, uh, 
Sure, we want to, to, to attract new uh, founders to Sao Paulo State to improve our ecosystem, but we have also some programs uh, dedicated for, for all. So if you want to check it out on the, our website, we can, you can see more about. Thank you. We had one more question. Dana? No? Was answered already. Okay, so thank you very much for the speakers. And now I invite everybody to one more question. Okay, we take this one, but please uh, introduce yourself and tell who you are and what's your startup idea so the speakers know more about you. Okay, my name is Isabella, and um, my startup's journey is a traveling app. And I have a question for Professor Lillian, because I was just opening the Sci GGZ website, and I didn't get to explore because I have to sign up. But can you tell me about more about the, the program and if it's free and how large is the user base? Yes, question. it's free. It's just for for we we aim to build and make our ecosystem stronger. So we in the university we are very uh, we always look to our own reality. So what we are doing with the six is that we open the possibilities of connection with outside, with the society. And this still the society wants to know us. So we are, it's just like a window where we are going to expose our solutions, which we are developing to the society. So it's a big opportunity and it's totally free. So this is what... Uh, what we want to do is to really engage the more people for us, for us to create this uh, strong ecosystem. And the importance, the, uh, there is something very important. As soon as you, and you create a user there, it passes through a, a, a supervision or analysis to understand if you are a real person. So we want to, to have people there that are really want to do connection and not just just book and try to take advantages. So this is not the real purpose. So we pass through an analysis to create your user. Okay? Thank you. So thank you. I just want to remind you that we still have more speakers after the coffee break of the DECAPES and FAPESP. And we also will have another uh, topic in our program today because Professor Zanku offered uh, that we can visit uh, the co-working space here and the future fabric downstairs. We will do this uh, just before lunch, okay? Have a nice break. Thank you. So welcome back, everyone. We will continue our program here today. Um, we have three agencies that will present themselves for opportunities of finance. It's CAPES. It's on a national level, PAPESP at Sao Paulo level, and the DAD, uh, the German level, <laughs> if you want so. So I will ask Leonardo to come here, who will present CAPES. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Leonardo Barchini, I'm a senior analyst at CAPES, of science and technology at CAPES. And I'm also a researcher uh, and a sort of entrepreneur, sort of old innovator. Uh, you are here, young innovators, I'm a, an old innovator. I have a company of five years ago, I founded a company also. But I will talk here about uh, CAPES and the Brazilian science and technology system. And uh, I tell you that to be an innovator in Brazil, 
uh, it's very important to know uh, where the science is and how the science works in Brazil. It was very important for my life and, uh, of course, for the life of uh, many of uh, entrepreneurs in Brazil. So, uh, CAPES is a federal agency of uh, that that deals. It's a public foundation that deals with the graduate system in Brazil. So, CAPES is responsible for post graduation courses uh, or graduation courses, graduation programs, as you call in the U.S. Uh, so, uh, if you wanna uh, have as an institution of uh, educational institution uh, a course of masters of or PhD, you will have to pass through CAPES. So CAPES is responsible for the regulation of the whole system. The Brazilian system is very centralized. It's a young system, uh, very centralized, has increased a lot, and everything that you produce in science through masters and PhD courses passes through CAPES which is uh, responsible uh, for certificate, evaluate, and accreditate uh, all the programs in Brazil. So um, we know that USP is the biggest university in Brazil. USP is from the state of Sao Paulo, not from the federal government. But all the masters and PhD courses of USP, they have to pass through the evaluation of CAPES to be certified. Uh, so that's, that's what we do. Uh, in one hand, we certify these courses, we evaluate these courses, we evaluate the scientific production in Brazil, and in the other hand, we, uh, through scholarships and fund uh, for projects, for science projects, we also try to improve the human resources in the country and abroad with undergraduate and graduate scholarships. Uh, we also uh, give financial support for the, these graduate programs. So we give scholarships and we also give some financial support uh, similar to what FAPESP, for example, does and what CNPQ, this is the National Council of Research of Brazil, does. Uh, we, have a very, we have very strong programs of international cooperation. Uh, so we have relationships with many countries as well as Germany. And we take care of the scientific information in Brazil through the periodics portal, that it's a, a portal in which you have all the, uh, the main scientific journals in the world, you have available it at this portal of CAPES. And if you are an university that has one, at least one course accredited by CAPES, evaluated by CAPES and approved by CAPES, you have the access to this portal. So we finance also uh, all the distribution. Uh, it's not a distribution anymore, but uh, through this portal, we distribute this information, all these journals to the Brazilian universities. We also deal with uh, continued training of basic education teachers, and we have an open university. What is the system of, of science and technology of masters and PhD programs? So we have over 370,000 students in Brazil. We have about 7,000 courses of uh, masters and PhD in Brazil. 40% uh, of them are in the southeast region, so it's very concentrated in this part of the country where we are. Uh, and CAPES grants about 85,000 scholarships of master's, PhD, and we divide these scholarships, one-third for social sciences, one-third for life science, and one-third for exacts and earth sciences. Um, this system, uh, mainly uh, in the universities, produce about 372,000 papers uh, published in indexed uh, journals, and one third of them are in the Paulistas University, so Universities of Sao Paulo. So just to show you the evolution of the graduated students in Brazil, so if you see that almost 35 years ago we had only 4,000 PhD students granted 
uh, in 87, and now we have sort of 90,000. And the scientific production of Brazil also, if we take 20 years from now, we uh, were way back in the 17th place, and now Brazil, it's about the 11th uh, place in scientific production. And then, uh, just to show you how big USP is, but uh, you will have the information of which universities are the best, or which universities have uh, the best programs, graduate programs in Brazil. It's available on campus, so you see that USP and UNESP, which is another state university of Sao Paulo, they have uh, a lot of uh, masters and PhD programs, so they have a lot of research. Uh, and finally, uh, just one minute, that in the international uh, sector, which I work, uh, we have many programs with many uh, international agencies, such as Fulbright Commission, Coffee Cube in France, we have the AD in Germany, DFG in Germany, Humboldt Foundation in Germany, and if you uh, if you want, in the website, there are a lot of information in which you can receive students, receive researchers from abroad, and send the students abroad also. So, thank you very much. So, thank you very much. Sorry for that, we don't know what it was with the microphone. Um, now I will call uh, Professor Eduardo Zancu from FAPESP to make his presentation on research and innovation through this perspective. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Pleasure to be here with you and to share some information about FAPESP. I'm Eduardo Zancu. I'm a professor here at the University of Sao Paulo at the School of Engineering, and at FAPESP I have an appointment as uh, a coordinator for the innovation program. So we have a team of uh, coordinators that are mainly professors uh, at universities, and they support the scientific director in defining the program policy. Uh, I will also introduce my team later on, because they can be uh, people you can contact in order to get more, more information. Um, I will give an overview about FAPESP, but I will focus on the innovation program PP that was already introduced in the previous panel, so this will make my uh, presentation easier. But I will detail some aspects of PP because I think it's uh, one of the most uh, uh, interests that you have in this week. So FAPESP stands for Sao Paulo Research Foundation. It has been established 60 years ago. In fact, yesterday was the celebration of the 60th uh, anniversary of FAPESP. We had a very uh, beautiful um, event yesterday at FAPESP building. And um, FAPESP promotes the development of science and technology in Sao Paulo State. Therefore, FAPESP collects and receives 1% uh, of the earned value tax in Sao Paulo State. And this provides FAPESP with a stable funding source and a very stable uh, operational condition. And FAPESP has a very subtle uh, and detailed evaluation pro process for projects, uh, for grants and for research projects. And uh, this uh, gives the, the researchers and the innovators uh, feedback with very detailed assessments that they can use to improve their projects. And uh, FAPESP funds both uh, projects and also scholarships. Uh, I will show you the detailed uh, breakdown of our funding uh, destination. Part is going to scholarships and part is going to project funds. So this chart shows the FAPESP allocation, how FAPESP allocates its budget. The budget is uh, about 400 million US dollars in, in purchase power parity uh, uh, yearly. Uh, in this reflects into more than 20,000 uh, running projects. Uh, the breakdown shows that uh, about one-fourth, 23% is going to scholarships. So we see here on the top right-hand corner. 
And we have support for infrastructure, mainly uh, investing in new equipment for universities and research institutes. We have 10% for research for innovation, and this is the fund that is going to PP program. And we see 7% for strategic topics. So FAPESP has defined five key topics that are highly relevant today. I will show them in the next slide. And they receive 7% of the funds. 1% is for scientific communication, uh, the magazine, uh, website, uh, YouTube channel, video production, and so on. And 46% is going to overall projects in many different areas from humanities to uh, technology, health sciences, uh, so on. So the key five topic areas that I mentioned to you previously are these ones that are uh, described in this chart. The idea was to elect five key areas to receive special attention and to be developed as a long-term uh, research program uh, with many research projects uh, coordinated as a uh, 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 coordinated effort. So we see here that our uh, areas related to challenges that we, s we are facing worldwide, so climate change, uh, the bioenergy, and biodiversity. Genomics is a focus for FAPESP, it has been a focus for more than 20 years, is a very strong uh, research area in Sao Paulo State, and also data science as a multidisciplinary program. So if you are interested in, in these areas, uh, the, there are websites and information about each of these areas and you can have access to the information, the researchers, the projects that are running and so on. So FAPESP funds science and also innovation. Better. Is uh, fund science and also innovation, we see here uh, the breakdown of the different programs for science and for innovation. And uh, in science, we have exploratory grants in order to start a new research, to identify a new area. There are grants that you can use to, uh, for short-term mobility, like the sprint is for short-term, one-week workshop. You can have the university in Brazil and the university in Germany working together in workshops in two directions. And also regular res research grants which are usually uh, defined for two years and have a grant amount of 300,000 reais. And we have longer term rent, uh, grants that are uh, focused on more ambitious uh, research targets and more uh, and broader and, and, and bigger re uh, research uh, groups. But also in this long term grants, we have one very interesting for, for some of you, that is the Young Investigator Award, is uh, one of the programs directed for young investigators to start their careers in, in research in Sao Paulo State. And, and then we have uh, regular scholarships for undergraduate, master, uh, doctoral programs and, and also postdoc programs. These scholarships, they may have also an international uh, component, uh, um, Recipients from, from the Sao Paulo State can go abroad with these scholarships, and there are also partnerships. Uh, we see here on the left hand side, international collaboration, there are partnerships for uh, both sides mobility. And the innovation, which I will focus uh, most, uh, comprises small business-led innovation programs, and here you see a list of PP uh, programs, PP1, 2, uh, PP Invest and PP was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation block as one of the most interesting uh, startup, uh, early stage startup uh, research grants. And I will detail PP then. And uh, we have company sponsored products aimed for uh, usually bigger companies, established companies that will invest, that will also invest. right here. Um, so the company sponsored is, uh, requires a uh, uh, participation uh, from the company, so it's, it's, uh, it's defined for usually uh, bigger companies. And we have academic corporate partnerships, usually for 
long-term projects with uh, uh, big companies, big corporates as well. So today I will focus more on the Small Business Innovation Research Award, the PP, and the different types of PP that may be very interesting for uh, some of you here today. So PP is a research and innovation grant program uh, to support innovation in small businesses or even businesses that are being created. In order to apply for a PP, you don't need to have your business established. You can have uh, your proposal, your idea, and you'll be on track to establish your business, but your business don't, do not need to have been established beforehand. The program is already more than 20 years old and has funded more than 1,700 uh, 1, companies, almost 1,800 1, companies, more than uh, 120 companies uh, per year. It, and it focuses uh, heavily on deep tech or at least on, on business that have a very uh, important technological component because the grant is for the technology development. The chart shows in blue the number of uh, project grants every, every year. So we see that in, in recent years we have about 200 uh, projects granted every year. So the chances of having a, 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 a project granted is, is high. We have uh, a, a program that has a considerable size. And the bars in red show the number of scholarships. Scholarships are a payment for the researcher responsible for one of the, the projects. The PP uh, is uh, widespread in many cities uh, in Sao Paulo state. More than 150 cities has, have companies supported by PP. Mm -hmm. So this chart shows uh, the Sao Paulo state map and the distribution of, uh, of uh, PP projects. Each bubble size uh, uh, means the number of projects in that particular city. We can see that there is a concentration of PP projects in, in this direction here. Um, in, in cities which have uh, strong universities or uh, technological uh, universities like Sao Paulo, of course, but also Campinas, then we have Piracicaba, São Carlos, uh, Ribeirão Preto, but also in other cities like Botucatu, São José do Rio Preto. And this is important because uh, some of the business that you may be thinking about, they, have, they may have a local component or they may profit from a specific environment or cluster uh, of companies and competencies. For instance, uh, Piracicaba is a very well-known center for agri-tech. So PP is established in, in different phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, and PP invest. So you may start with phase one, submitting a proposal. For phase one, you don't need to have your company established beforehand, so as a legal entity, you may submit the proposal. It's focused on the uh, viability analysis, so technological viability, scientific viability. The duration should be up to nine months. And as exploratory grant, the amount is up to 300,000 reais. Then if you succeed, you can go to PP phase do, uh, 2 immediately, or you can, if you have already uh, uh, the proof of viability, you can apply directly for phase 2. Phase 2 is for the actual development. The duration could be up to two years, and the budget up to 1 million reais. And then, in order to introduce uh, the project in the market, you can apply for phase three. Phase one and phase two are open all year, so you can submit at any time, but phase three is dependent on calls, on specific calls. They are not open all the time. And there is a support, a complementary entrepreneurship training program, usually for early stage startups, that you can apply and have it as an additional training support while you have the PP grant, it's called PP Empreendedor. And there is also an additional investment line called PP Invest. PP Invest is aimed for companies that uh, have already received PP phase one or phase two, and they have also a private investor. And FAPESP can match funds with the private, uh, private investor up to one million reais and an additional 24 months project.
So this shows that uh, you can have support as your idea, your proposal is evolving through different technology readiness levels. So FAPESP has established already several, has supported already several companies, as I showed, more than 1,700 companies. Here we see a portrait organi organized in some areas uh, that are, have a strong development like healthcare, biotech, agriculture, manufacturing, including Industry 4.0, uh, many areas in, in information technology, and also energy and smart cities. But all areas can apply for PP, not restricted to this one. But this is a nice portfolio with companies that have already grown, have already been uh, incorporated by bigger companies or export their services and products. So one additional also that might be interesting for uh, uh, international cooperation, uh, FAPESP will probably uh, launch a call among the Eureka, Eureka um, uh, framework in partnership with Germany. This is uh, not yet uh, final, and, but FAPESP has entered the Eureka Global Stars program, and this may allow the, uh, the cooperation between one company in Germany and one company in Brazil working together on the same project. So uh, you should be uh, you should look for information and updates if you are interested, because this may be launched this year. And finally, our our team, if you have more questions, I will be here uh, and happy to answer your questions uh, in the final discussion panel. But also, if you have questions, there is uh, an official contact point at FAPESP website. FAPESP website has lots of information. There is an official contact point uh, called Converse com a FAPESP, to talk to FAPESP. And you, you, if you uh, send your questions, you get an answer. And also, these are my colleagues in our adjunct panel. Uh, they may be contact people for you to get more information. I will leave you with the FAPESP uh, website address. As I told you, there are many information. Some information about PP are in Portuguese. So if you need translation and for more detailed information, get in contact with you. It uh, uh, will be a pleasure to assist you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Vancouver. And now I will invite uh, Francine Amelin from the AD to talk a little bit about these possibilities of finance, uh, Francini makes the counseling for students and researchers. Yes. And I also wanted to mention that Professor Zanku is a former DAD alumnus also, <laughs> and an engineer. I forgot to introduce that. Thank you, Francine. Good morning, everyone. I hope you are enjoying this week, this intensive week. On Monday, you get to know my director, and our director, né, Johan Hellman. I want, uh, and, and sorry, <laughs> and, uh, he, he was probably introducing you to the ID, né, to the German Academic Exchange Service. And um, today, I'm talking about the scholarships opportunities and, as in projects or individual mobility. And again, né, my name is Francine Camelina, and I have an office inside the German Science of Innovation and Innovation House here in Sao Paulo and also in Goethe Institute um, for counseling students or postgraduate students or researchers to carry out their research or their studies in Germany. So if you have any question later, you can also contact me. And that for Germans and the other nationals, maybe you can contact our central né, in Germany. And we will talk about that, this later too, because there are other different né, opportunities for you né, in Germany for um, study or research in Brazil. But it's mostly um, individual mobility né, as well. It's not like FAPESP né, that offers these opportunities for launch, uh, startup a business. Né? It's a little bit different. So I will change here the slides. Well, this this slide is, all, uh, is for you to know né, how we. We operate né, it's mostly cooperations né, in all levels, academic levels, and in our areas too, in 60 countries, mostly. And our main goal is always to promote the internationalization of, of German institutions or Brazilian too, né, together. So, 
just very, very brief. Here are the, our representations né, on the world. Here in São Paulo, we have two offices, and in Rio, we had another one, uh, our central one. And we have also six professors, visiting professors in Brazil, in other states and cities, too. I forgot to say. And here is the, uh, for those of you who doesn't know Germany yet, né, we have a, an overview here of all universities. Né. 241 are associates, but there are more. And they are they are different themselves né, between universities, né, technical universities, more traditional, that offers doctorate and so on. And also the sci uh, applied sciences universities that are more focused on the job market, industrial research maybe, and goes up to master. No, they don't offer usually doctorate. So we have also music and arts faculties. Most of these uh, universities are also public, like USP, and they offer many course courses free of charge, free of any fee. It's uh, just a small fee usually né, for the semester tickets, for, for example, or housing and stuff. Um, it, it's also good to know if you don't already, doesn't already know, that research uh, can be done in universities, in non-research, uh, non-university research institutions, and also in, 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 the, in the industry. These three né, actors, they make, the, they promote science together, usually. So you can search not, not only, for example, in the DAD, but other research institutions too. For example, the Max Planck, Fraunhofer, Leibniz, all of those have scholarships. I think Alexander von Humboldt was already already there, né, presenting their scholarships or not? Alexander von Humboldt. No, they have also an interesting scholarship, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. It's in the last slide, uh, the database uh, for projects. Uh, they call German Chancellor Fellowship. So if you can check later, né, uh, Brazilian especially. Uh, it's open until October each, each year. Uh, one uh, this this until one, uh, October is open for all areas, and there is another one open only for sustainable areas. Th that's usually until April. The, the name is German Chancellor Sh Fellowship. It's one year, né, for you to um, uh, carry out your project in Germany né, with funding from Alexander von Humboldt. But we we will have a database in the end. Then you can check the seeing Africa. Uh, So I I will talk. Uh, this is the, the overview now of all our scholarships. I will not go into detail everyone, ever each of everyone, because um, some of you are already doing masters or doctorate, nor not are not students anymore. But this kind of you can uh, next please. This one, for example, uh, also master students and doctorate students can apply for a German course in Germany. It will be available next year. And you have to present a little bit of Germ German also. But it's, um, uh, it's very important né, for you to, to, get, uh, to get more contact with the professors, for example, for the, with the projects and with the managers of this project. So uh, it's op an opportunity to, to learn German in Germany. But only next year it will be available. So next is the um, development-related postgraduate courses. This is important because it's a master course. It's a full master door, uh, in Germany. But you have to present two years of experience prior né, to the application. Uh, th we have a list. Né, there are almost 40 courses, also doctorate courses. And we have a list in the next slide for you to know né, in which areas we have courses, né? almost all areas. Only IT, mechanical engineering, maybe we don't have in this program. So they are defined. We have a list né? in our website. And the application is directly with the university. So we have to apply directly. Once you get the scholarship, then the DAD contact you to, to tell you about the, the payments and travel expenses and so on. Uh, the monthly payment now is 931 euros for all master courses we offer. We also cover the travel expenses, health insurance, and the German course, né? because all of, the, of these courses are taught in English, so you don't have to, to really have German knowledge. Next, please. So the Helmut Schmidt is more for humanities. I don't think we have anyone here from humanities or public policy, good governance. I think it's not the case here, so I will not 
talk deeply about, but if you know somebody that is, that is from this area, you also have this scholarship, and it, it doesn't require the two-year experience. So, that's a good one. Next, uh, this is the areas, no? and then the arts and music, we also have a program for that. This is a little bit different because you can choose your courses. No? There, is no, there are no lists no? Uh, with courses, but it's not the case here too. Uh, next, please. Uh, next. And then we have doctorate programs together with CAPES. No? It's a long time agreement we have with CAPES each year. Uh, usually on the, in the second semester we open no, the call, the joint call. Uh, and uh, we are all these uh, modalities, how can I say that? Yeah, all these types, no? they are full doctorate or a co to tell or a binational in a sandwich model we say here. And the AD pays, uh, if you get the scholarship from the AD, you will receive 1,200 euros né, a month. The travel allowance, insurance cover, and the, the German course as well. Last call, we had 30 scholarships. And the nec next semester, we will see how many we, c we will be able to, to offer. So next slide is about the modalities. Yeah, three to four years. You can stay there up to four or five years if you get a scholarship from the AD. But it's not possible to choose né, between agencies. Né? You, you apply for, a, for this call, né? so the, the, the commission will choose you. Né? And if you, ha if, you have, uh, né? if you want to know more about you can check the last call, because it's always the same, né? changes very little things, so you can check the last call to be prepared for that in the second semester. So next slide. The co-funded research grants is also with CAPES and FAPESP, né, both of the agencies that are already presented here today. And it's for doctorate, uh, doctorate students here né, uh, in Brazil, uh, for, from two to six months. If you want to visit an industry, a lab, um, an archive, né, and uh, to progress in your in our project, né, you can use this scholarship. Né, and the DAD complements né, the, the scholarship you already have with FAPESP or CAPES. Second semester two the, is the, the next call. So next slide, please. And the research days is also for professors. I don't think it's the case here. No, we don't have any professors, maybe. But yeah, just for you to know, no, for your professors. We also have this kind of scholarships on the other side no, for German professors that want to, to, to stay here for three months, six months, a year, maybe, no, visiting professors. We do that. We receive that all the time here. So. You can check in our website for the Brazilian professors and in the website from the Germany, né, uh, our central, for the German professors. And next slide. Um, it is a study visit. This is also important because you have, if, you ha if you are part of a group, study group or a project, né, you can say your professor here in Brazil that we have this funding for uh, 12 days, two weeks né, in Germany to visit some institutions there né, and use this kind of funding. Né, we, we, we have a call tri three times a year at least, but the professor has to make the application. So you can say to them if you are part of a project like that. So next, um, the Probral. The Probral, I will just say, it's, a, it's, the, it's the project, joint projects that we have né, with FAPESP and PROPASP with FAPESP. Uh, Probral pro with CAPES and PROPASP pro with FAPESP. They are very similar. And uh, Probral, we, had, we have an open call right now until 31, uh, 31st of May. But it's now for projects uh, for university professors né, that apply for that. Um, that, also, that also include the particip participation of doctoral candidates, but you will have to, to, to be part né, of this project. That's why I don't get into me, me, into detail of this program because it's not an individual project. No? It's more like a joint uh, project between German and Brazilian institutions. Uh, it's very traditional. No? Since 1994, we have these projects. We are also celebrating our 50th years, 50 years of uh, Brazilian office here this year. But our party will be on in the next in the end of the year. So it's very uh, traditional, this, this kind of cooperation with CAPES. 
The next one is Propasp. It's almost the same. It's also open until 6 um, sixth of June, no? next week. They, are, we, we, they offer uh, 30 projects for two years. And uh, after, I think, two years of interruption, we were able to open again. So it's a very good news for, for those who are part of these projects. And next one, maybe it's a slide about, yeah, this, this one. Uh, you can check in the funding guide. Um, the Brazilians and other nationals can, can find né, um, funding for themselves, individual or in a, mostly individual mobility. And in the above one, né, also known as the is for German, German students and researchers um, for uh, carrying out their research outside Germany, not in Germany. So for you to know, these um, two main databases are very important to find your uh, um, scholarship in the AD and also in other institutions. The funding guide, for example, they uh, listed also the, the other institutions. So next one is our contact, I think. Yeah, it's my contact and also our Instagram, all this kind of um, communication work that we do. And if you have any questions, we can answer later on this day. Okay, thank you. And have a, have a lot of success in your projects. Thank you, Francine. But I will ask you to stay here and ask the other two speakers to come. So who has questions, please? This one. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question for FAPESP first, and then a question for the DAAD. The first to FAPESP, uh, there are lots of masters and PhD students that has the scholarship and sees a lot of potentials, potential on their projects to become future entrepreneurs, but they like to want to start as soon as possible, but they are unable to starts because of a rule of the scholarship that is like if you are chief executive or of this of a startup you like you, you lost your scholarship so it became a limitation for these people especially an uh, example is the george that was the i uh, speaking uh, yesterday uh, he had a project that was really good for the, the people, because it's a, it was a rapid test, he wants to start as soon as possible, but due to this rule, he, he has to wait to finish the, his, uh, his, page, his master's to then start entrepreneurship. So the question is, uh, FAPESP foments innovation, so why there are these kind of limitations? Can you hear me? Yes. So thank you for the question. Uh, it's always good when we reflect on the grounds and why is uh, a rule there. So FAPESP aims that uh, the research being developed is of high quality. And both a graduate program, master or PhD, and an entrepreneurship uh, initiative, both they require a lot of effort, usually full-time effort. So if we aim to have high good research quality in the graduate program and or if we aim to have very good entrepreneurship outputs we have to dedicate a lot of time a lot of effort so we understand and FAPESP understands that both are or should be full-time activity uh, this does, does not mean that you cannot transition so you can be in the final phase of your graduate program you can start thinking on your entrepreneurship activity. You can start thinking on transitioning to entrepreneurship. But uh, in order to be paid by FAPES before each activity, you have to be full-time dedicated so that you, you have better, better results uh, as well. So the transition phase is tricky. It's not easy to define. Uh, there is not only one option. 
uh, you have to phase out one, phase in the other phase. Uh, but uh, we understand that both should be full-time activities. Uh, I also recommend you uh, look for more information on, on the new uh, type of PP called knowledge transfer. It's, uh, it's a new one has been launched uh, in the end of the last year. It's devoted for research groups and researchers that want to transition a uh, uh, research result developed in the university, in the research center, to a company. So this is uh, well suited for the situations in which there is knowledge in the research group that will be transferred to a new startup and the transition phase is also uh, well defined with researchers from both the company, the new company, and the research group working together. So I hope I, I answered no, your question. No, it was really good. Thank you. Thank you. And for the DAAD, the question is a simple question. Uh, when I apply to the PhD in Germany, do I need to have a research proposal? Yes? Yes, it follows the... Um, Plataforma Chagas rules, né? it's uh, mostly more Brazilian rules than the German ones. Né? We call the, the application process of the Plataforma Chagas, so we have to present your proposal, the letter of accept acceptance of a German né? professor, and your CV lattes, all these documents that are very common here for academics. Thank you. Okay, someone else? Have a question? Okay, don't forget to present yourself. Who are you and what's your project, please? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ivan, and I'm basically working with um, uh, ag tech in the genomic sector. Uh, yeah. Uh, my question is actually for Eduardo. You mentioned that you don't need to be established legally as an entity in Brazil to access PIPE, right? So how do you do that? Do you, you have to have like a partner that's like uh, I don't know another company or you access the as a like a person like how, how is it exactly the access and just to make a comment uh, for the Brazilians that aim to go for a DAD scholarship I was a DAD scholarship holder for my whole PhD in Germany so I'm still there actually finishing my PhD thesis now and uh, yeah, start looking for a collaboration in Germany first. So a professor that kind of like have uh, research that's pretty much what you want to do. And that's the first thing that you should do. That's the first start. And then you can write your project and even talk to him to adjust that better. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for a question. So in order to submit the proposal for FAPES PPP phase one, you actually don't need a legal entity in Brazil. You can submit as a project coordinator. You always specify your project team. You can include team members. So you submit the whole project. Only the, the legal entity is established as to be defined. And once the project is granted, in order to, be, to have the contract, the final contract with FAPESP, then you need the legal entity. So you, but you don't need the legal entity uh, to submit and to wait for uh, the, the assessment results. Um, uh, if you are a company established in Germany, you can have a, a partner in, in Brazil or you can establish a branch in Brazil because FAPESP only funds, uh, uh, in, in case of PIPI, the research portion that is developed in Brazil, in Sao Paulo State specifically. So you need a partner here or you need a branch here. If you have a, it could be a, a foreign company, a German company, but with a branch in Sao Paulo in which that specific part of the research supported by FAPESP will be, will be developed. And maybe one last information, there is a, a pilot phase of a simplified PP submission that is open until 15th of uh, June, so it's very short term. And the, during this pilot phase, the submission process is sim simplified with less documents focusing mostly on the the proposal, the, the project proposal. Okay. Much. One more question here and one there. Please, short. So the, for the PP program, um, the, it has to be a Brazilian startup or it can be an established company already. If the partner is, you know, if the company is in Germany and the partner should be in Brazil. 
So it, it can be, uh, the company can be established anywhere, uh, but the part that is funded by FAPESP needs to be applied in Sao Paulo state. So if you have established uh, or non-established company in Germany, you have to have a, a branch in Brazil or a partner in Brazil or something being established in Brazil in Sao Paulo state to develop that part that will be funded by FAPESP. You know what I mean is uh, the partner here uh, can be either a startup or university even maybe partnership or established company already. Uh, very good question. Uh, for the PP program, the PP is uh, the innovation program for companies. The funds are going for, for companies. It can be an established company up to 250 uh, employees, so small size, it, uh, or a startup, a new company. But companies of any size from zero being established to 250 employees can receive PP grants. So PP is not aimed for universities, for university partnerships. Therefore, you, you need to apply for the uh, research grants, not for the innovation grants. So there are other grants for universities. Thank you, who wanted? And then we will have to finish this part, sorry. Hello, my name is Lydia from Brazil. Uh, I wanted to ask to DAAD about the German Chancellor Fellowship, the one year uh, fellowship for research. Uh, it can be for undergrad, like your um, graduation thesis, or just for like uh, graduate student studies. You have to present your uh, your diploma. So uh, undergraduates, um, uh, bachelor, né? if you have already your bachelor or your master, mestrado, né? or doctoral. There are three <coughs> possibilities. Né? And the, the monthly payments are different. Regarding this, this aspect, uh, if, you are, if you have already a bachelor degree, you receive maybe 2,000 something. And if you have a doctorate, you receive a little bit more. It's like that. It's from Alexander Pumbo, it's not a big scholarship, but uh, we also yeah, <laughs> make the advertisement for that. <laughs> Okay, so you need to have finished your bachelor first. You cannot do as an undergrad. No, no, unfortunately not. You have to present a project after your graduation. Oh, I see. Thank you. You can start now. Yeah, to search a professor or <laughs> advisor there. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have more questions, please contact the speakers directly afterwards. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for the speakers. We are going to the next part, uh, for the checklist. For a checklist for a step towards Brazil and Germany. And we will have a speaker from GPI, Gloria Rosi. Thank you very much for being here. So, um, well, I'm thankful for the opportunity to present for Germany Trade and Invest, uh, GTAI, um, a bit about the German um, ecosystem for German for startups and uh, what we are doing in order to promote this business environment in Germany. Um, and also to kind of trace maybe important steps that might be to, uh, important to consider for Brazilian startups with a view to expand their operation in Germany as well as Brazilian startups, uh, German startups trying to explore the market in Brazil. Um, what is Germany Trade and Invest? What are we doing? This is uh, my starting point. Um, so, are you? No, you can if you want to. Okay, about us, uh, just uh, to mention, we are part of the German promotions um, uh, mechanisms for to promote uh, exports from Germany to Brazil and to all other parts in the whole world. 
Um, Germany is an uh, economy based on small and medium-sized enterprises and not everyone has the opportunity to um, explore foreign markets or to have uh, market analyzers uh, in all over the world in every country. So Germany is actually uh, promoting their exports by um, investing in uh, infrastructure. Um, Germany Trade and Invest is... Uh, uh, observing the markets all over the world and bringing the information to the German companies. We are also working to attract investments. If you can go. Uh, so we have a worldwide net. Um, there are more than four, 50 locations where we are actually uh, located. Uh, here in Sao Paulo, it's me and my colleague Renata, who is here as well. Um, and we are here actually doing something that our colleagues in Germany would be doing. I think we have another presentation, or is that presentation cancelled? We will? Okay, and it will be online, right? So, um, actually, I sh might have uh, chosen this way to um, because I'm not responsible for the area of uh, innovation and trend scouting, but uh, I will try to bring you some of the insights. Um, and I will do that by starting with the Digital Hub Initiative, which is um, the German um, organization or how to promote uh, the open um, innovation, how to promote interaction between startups and small and medium-sized uh, businesses. And then I will uh, just give a short outlook about the German ecosystem. If you are interested and more interested in the German um, uh, ecosystem, then you should maybe follow up the webinar. Um, there was today, this morning, Sylvia from Invest Sao Paulo. I think she mentioned already that we have a webinar coming up on Tuesday, comparing the different ecosystems in France, UK, uh, Spain, Portugal, and Germany. And I will participate and present the advantages of the German ecosystem. And I think that's actually the the most uh, interesting part to see what are the differences. Um, Germany opted for a model um, which should bring all the partners together and allow a faster um, meeting of all the actors involved in innovation by startups. And the goal is to uh, accompany the transition to a digitalized economy and to bring Germany to the next uh, step to the through the revolution uh, of digitalization. Um, this uh, network is organized all over Germany by uh, 12 hubs, and they are specialized in themes, as we will see on the next uh, slide. Just uh, can you maybe go back? Yes. Just a few numbers. Um, this network was started in 2017 and this is uh, what was achieved until now. So we have a very vivid um, environment with a lot of startups participating, but as well small and medium-sized enterprises engaging in this open innovation. And you have also the multinational corporates. Important to mention, or one of the most uh, um, stressed, uh, the, the, the most important uh, advantages of the German system is actually that we are uh, interacting, we have a huge interaction with academic institutions. Um, on the next slides, just to, for you to have an overview about the different um, hubs in Germany, they are connected uh, among themselves. So we have, for example, two centers of for logistics, which is one in ha Dortmund and the other one in Hamburg. And um, this is an, a huge advantage in order to have clusters, so that startups are actually focusing on their field and having... Um, a, a good way to connect. Um, then I will jump over to the ecosystem. Oh, okay, this is one more time, the, so a few numbers for you in order to see what the Digital Hub Initiative actually brought up to... Um, and yes, please, go on. 
Okay, um, Germany um, is one of the most important markets for startups in Europe. We are uh, second placed after UK, um, the same on the same level as France, and uh, especially in the last year, the ecosystem really was booming. Um, the venture capital funding was going up very high, and uh, uh, startups are uh, having a huge success, even though that German, the German economy is uh, also facing crisis throughout the pandemic and now uh, through the new geopolitical um, shift in the, with the war in, in Ukraine. You can please, next slide. Um, one interesting aspect is that uh, the business models are focusing, well, this is actually kind of worldwide uh, tendency. It's uh, um, uh, uh, the business as a service or the, the, the how do you say that, <laughs> SAAS. Um, we, we, it's the most uh, common business model for startups to implement. Um, and you have a lot of startups as you have in Brazil as well in the technology sector and in informatics sector. But then on, on second place is healthcare, uh, which is also one of the economic uh, fields that Germany is highly investing and exporting to other countries. I have to, I have to heat up a bit the speed. So um, where are the most uh, startups located in Germany? Um, you can see that Northern Westphalia and Berlin is top on top of the ranking, and this is also uh, well one of the reasons that uh, those local startup uh, ecosystems are uh, booming so much is because they are also funded. They have state level organizations initiatives, um, as well as Bavaria does, Baden-Württemberg has, Hessen and Saxony also has a state level initiative which is uh, promoting startups and uh, open innovation and here i want to just point out one i think a very interesting point most startups in germany have a, a strategy which is based on uh, ecological or societal impact and I, t I see a huge possibility to combine synergies between Germany and Brazil because here we have such a huge potential in order to uh, contribute to those, uh, to, to those means. And um, while we were brainstorming what we could present to you, um, we were thinking about having one list for Germany and one list for Brazil, but actually that doesn't make so much sense because the topics are the same and you would just have to consider different um, points of view, different facts. So we are kind of joining both, both environments, going through it, um, starting with the main understanding of cultural differences, the country, what are the main demands that this country does bring to the, so, to, uh, the economy. And uh, as you can see, if you are not adapting to the needs of the country, then this is also uh, kind of, uh, yeah, there are some failures that you can uh, step into and invest uh, in a way that is not efficient. Um, N26 is coming to Germany, to Brazil this year. They are launching their service this year. And Brazil has such a vivid fintech um, uh, economy that they are trying to find their place. What can they bring to Brazil so that they are not uh, going down in um, the competition? And they are thinking about uh, bringing more education and they want to... Um, kind of uh, line out as uh, the first fin care of Brazil. So they have found uh, a small niche in the market where they can find uh, a special uh, meaning for Brazil and invest in that. And what is also interesting is that they had a kind of a trial out with a thousand customers before going and launching their service. So they are actually trying out first and 
uh, relying on the responses that they have in that country uh, so, and adapting their model that they want to implement. Next slide. Um, of course, you have to uh, always, oh, I think you, it, it's, well, um, the second point, you, it's, it's stepped. Can you please go back? Um, so the second point is to have a look at the local startup ecosystem um, and the dynamics so that you can maybe find partners, that you can maybe exchange uh, your views. And, uh, well, it's slipped again, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> we will go through, and uh, I only have five minutes left. So um, the third point we want to point out here is uh, to have a look at maybe your technology in your country, you can adapt best to a certain economic sector, but in another country, maybe your uh, technology would, be, uh, would help and support another economic sector. So don't uh, kind of um, try to implement exactly the same thing in another country. Be open-minded and try to see if your technology might bring scale wins or some uh, possibilities to interact in another field. Well, there you have something very, um, the market, oh, well, um, I think that will happen again. But, so let's be short, um, a market entry plan is something very, a, a huge um, analysis that you have to make, how to enter in the market. You can lose a lot of money by doing that with a very um, uh, aggressive method by buying other enterprises, or you can try to find partners. Flixbus is, was entering the market last year um, after Buzzer and uh, WeMobi and they have to place themselves and they opted for a partnership instead of just buying some company and investing a lot of money. And uh, in order to construct this, um, you have to always uh, find out a lot more about te the tax system, bio bureaucratic, uh, um, legal rights, uh, all kinds of um, questions have to be considered so you should not do that on your own. Always try to find uh, advisors that you can trust. And there are a lot of advisors working in the German-Brazilian field. And they can also translate a bit better what that means for you. If you try to understand the tax system in another country, especially for German companies, to understand the Brazilian tax system is so complicated. Uh, and if you have a partner organization and advisor that is already into this environment, German Brazilian environment, then they can translate a bit better what that means for German companies. Next slide, please. Um, mostly, in order to have success in another country, you need uh, to have this to to get over the cultural gap, and it's uh, most much easier to do that with local staff. Um, as a seventh point as well uh, for the networking to find local partners. Um, Germany with the Digital Hub Initiative is actually facilitating this. So if you are a Brazilian entrepreneur entering Germany, you can very fast find your partners and get in touch with them, which is a huge advantage. On the eighth slide, we will close up. And um, of course, marketing is a, a huge factor. And uh, every country has its own uh, ways in order to communicate. Brazil is very open-minded. Germany isn't so much. So in order to, for you to get the message to your customers, you might also want to consider different channels or different ways. And all that has to be considered when you are uh, going abroad with your business, it is, if it is to Germany or if it is from Germany to Brazil. So thank you very much. If you are interested in our work, you just have a look at our site, uh, at our page. We, will, um, we are bringing information on the Brazilian market in the German language. And we are bringing also information about Germany in English. So you can find all this information about all sectors, business sectors, also digitalization on our page. Um, yes, thank you very much. So.
Thank you very uh-huh. much, Gloria, uh, who is in charge of the office of the German Trade and Invest and is also alumna of the University of Köln, which we have some people here of Köln, and perhaps you can exchange afterwards. Uh, now we have an online part, and Pamela is just managing to make it work here. So Hi, is that <laughs> Hello. Hi, how are you? Hello. <laughs> now we have uh, Jan Felix Bema from IF and IF Innovators Net Germany. Welcome. Welcome, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot. Hi guys, how are you? Everything all right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's Perfect, that's great, yeah. Thanks a lot for having me around and to get some insights on the German innovation system, AIF and the AIF Innovators Net. Um, I'm right now in a short vacation, that's why I'm in a more, you know, informal look, um, but I definitely want to take the time to, with you guys, uh, although I'm on vacation right now, so I'm really happy to be here, and I ha- have to find, to find some slides. I will start um, with some Hesha Kutcher like uh, slides to give you an impression what you might think about innovation um, in Germany, and then I will give you some insights on the AIS, and yeah, feel free to ask questions, and feel free to give some remarks, and yeah, I'm looking forward to 30 minutes of innovation with you. Okay, wait a second, Kutcher. So, here we go. Perfect. So most of you guys, uh, or most of you might think about Germany, um, when thinking about Germany, you might think about something like this, castles, you know, a lot of, lot of history, or even good German beer and, you know, people from, from the Oktoberfest. That's what I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about innovation, research, and um, the, um, what, you know, what's the role of the AIF and AIF innovators net when it comes to innovation. Okay, then let's talk about innovation. Most people think that innovation is happening in Germany in the huge cities like Berlin, Munich, Cologne, Hamburg, which is not, you know, totally false, but which is also not totally true, um, like we will see later on. So um, we will see that innovation is happening in Germany maybe in different ways than in other countries, and the, the so-called small and medium enterprise or Mittelstand is really important for the German innovation system and cooperating or doing, you know, innovation in collaboration with the German Mittelstand. Yeah, when thinking about research, um, what I'm often find in uh, international, you know, um, audiences or there is that, you know, people think about the German universities, that is a picture of the German university from the 50s. Um, and once again, that is not totally false, but a lot of innovation, a lot of innovation with regard to um, climate change, with regard to H2, with regard to topics like um, IoT, robotics, is not happening in universities, but it's happening also, once again, in small and medium enterprises, or the so-called um, non-university research institutions like Paul Hofer, Max Planck, or Helmholtz. Um, yeah, this is you know, what you might think about when thinking about researchers in Germany, and all, you know, bearded, white-haired men, and luckily, this is changing a lot, so um, research in Germany and the research institutions are opening up and um, it's got much more diverse, and once again, not only in universities, but also in companies. So, when we talk about innovation and the German innovation system, as I said, um, it is not only important to look at the university system or the huge cities, but especially to look after uh, or to look at into the so-called small and medium enterprises because they are, you know, doing a lot. Uh, maybe the hugest or the largest or the largest part of um, the innovation work and you know the research, especially when it comes to industry research. I'm not talking about so-called you know fundamental research where you you know do research for its own purpose. But especially when it comes to each research with, um, with it, uh, what is focused um, on a direct application in economy, in you know, in society, 
The so-called small medium enterprises in Germany are really important, and doing collaboration with German industry and German uh, um, SMEs is even more important. Yeah, and then um, there's those, you know, as I mentioned, um, non university research institutions. For example, here, this is the um, one of AIS Research Institute in Schwedish Grund, which is a small town pretty close to Stuttgart. And um, that's also very typical of Germany. You have universities, you have front of the institutions, but you have also nearly 200 non-university, non-government or public funded research institutions, which are really cutting edge. And in this example, um, one of the world's best research institutions, for example, when it comes to industry research. And um, that's also yeah, a typical, typical thing for Germany that we do have this very diverse and very decentralized you know, research structure with a lot of also smaller institutions which are really, really, really holding up well and uh, playing in the German, uh, playing in the World Champions League when it comes to industry research like this one here in Schwäbischmünd, which is a town or city you might not have heard of, heard of before in the Mesa, but um, it's really one of the international hubs when it comes to research in this case um, uh, for fine materials and um, for application, for example, of H2 um, in industry. Yeah, once again, um, when talking about industry or innovation in industry in Germany, a lot of people still think that it looks like this one, you know, large, you know, um, entities, large companies situated in the rural area, for example. But once again, it's no more like this. A lot, and also not like this one, the reality is more like this, because the Falke, a company, you know, from, from the Sauerland, which is a very rural area in Germany, and that's also very important, and might be different to Brazil, for example, or other um, countries of the world, is that 95% of the German innovators are not situated in the large, huge cities, but they are situated in the rural areas, like, for example, in this case, the Sauerland, or like in areas, um, in Baden-Württemberg, in the southern part of Germany. And what I come to find is that when people, especially young people, come to Germany, they all want to go to the huge corporate and you know, do their you know, internships there and do their research interns there. But once again, the really stronghold of German innovation system, the small and new enterprises, they are not situated in Wolfsburg, Stuttgart, Cologne, or Berlin. They are situated mostly in regions like this one, or where I'm sitting right now in the so-called Bergisch slum, which are more rural areas. So that's, you know, typical, you know, for German innovation system, and as, you know, my advice um, also for international partners, do not only look, you know, for the large corporates, OEMs, and cities, also look at, um, or ha have a look into that um, most of Germany's innovation business when it comes to industry is not happening in the large corporates or in the large, you know, um, in the large cities or in the large, you know, minis, minis, uh, large, you know, like the capital city. It's happening in the um, in the rural areas um, and from companies which are, you know, there for hundreds of years. Have ever have um, they have um, changed the business model quite frequently, adapted to challenges internationally, and um, are still you know cutting edge and you know what we call so-called hidden champions. They are you know really having you know market shares of 80 to 90 percent in some areas, um, having a lot of IPs at their hands for so international property, and are really you know kind of innovative. Yeah. So what? Yeah. Okay, then you might ask, what's the role of the AIF and what can we, you know, are there possibilities to cooperate with the AIF or how to get in contact with this, you know, innovative companies or the system? And that's why I will give you a brief, you know, overview about what the AIF is doing and, um, well, there might be very specific areas of possible cooperation, for example, with Gravel. Yeah, AIF at a glance, what is the AIF? AIF is, I hope it will work, so we'll give you a short video. Oh. Unfortunately, we do not have um, sound, but... 
thing is wrong. Yeah, there is no sound at the moment. Well, maybe you need to share your. You can send the link on the chat, and I I can show uh, I'm directly. Sorry, later because I'm not sure how it works in Google Meet, so um, Are you like a team. The link of the video I, on the I, I understand it. Okay. Basically, what it's about is you know the AIF is the Joint Federation of Industrial Research Associations. So it's been you know, like a huge network bringing together all the innovative researchers, all the innovative small and medium enterprises, and all the innovative. Um, research institutions, like I mentioned before, the German uh, word is Arbeitsgemeinschaft Industrieller Forschungsvereinigung, in English is German Federation of Industrial Research Association. And it's basically what's happening there is, you know, this kind of research I mentioned before, conducted uh, in collaboration by small and medium enterprises, researchers, and larger companies to, um, to tackle uh, the huge, you know, challenges of our time, for example, like climate change or like, you know, uh, H2 in application or IoT robotics and stuff like this. So, um, the ARF is the leading research network of the German Mittelstand. There is no such thing in, in the world or no such thing in Germany. Um, and since the 50s, it stimulates funds for research transfer and innovation, you know, and it is your very strong base in German industry. And therefore, it's really a factor for, you know, our competitiveness um, of the national economy because the AIF is really doing uh, doing their work to get this innovation out on the market and get this innovations, you know, um, from the German Mittelstand to um, to get them to get them in yeah in relevant products, for example. So you can see here the members are the one that industrial research associations. You um, might ask what is this? That are you know the network, for example, if it comes to automotive, bringing together nearly five fifty thousand small and medium enterprises. Um, um, which are, you know, from automotive to um, biotechnology to lightweight, um, uh, you know, encompassing the whole structure of, uh, and sectors of German industries, and what uh, we also doing for the German uh, for the German government, we doing what is called uh, the Central Innovation Program for Small and Medium Enterprises. ZIM, you might have heard of it, might have heard of it. Of that also international part of them, which is called IYSME, which is also open for international partners, and of course the so-called IGF Industrial Common Research. I will go into that a little later. So since um, the founding of the IIF, the IIF has you know um, diverted or uh, has you know um, has you know um, distributed around 13.5 billion euros euros to research projects, um, especially for small and medium enterprises, and approximately um, 250,000 projects were launched within the AIF funding schemes and the AIF network, which is pretty much and is once again unmatched for on the international uh, on the international um, on the international scheme. Just in 2021, uh, the AIF has carried out more than 10,000 R&D, so research and development projects, once again, ranging from A, which is automotive, B, biotechnology, um, all what's, you know, relevant for industry. And that's, once again, um, pretty remarkable because there is no such system in the world which is comparable. Maybe maybe there is, uh, in, in Austria, something similar, but um, I'm pretty sure that it's, in size, it's not comparable. Um, yeah, so there is also a lot of money in the system, especially when it comes to the IGF and ZIM, that um, are the project public funds managed by the ARF right now. So you see it's, uh, it's nearly um, 550 million euros a year, which goes directly into research for small and medium enterprises. And um, therefore, you know, boosts are really uh, hard small and medium enterprises to get competitiveness on the international market. 
In the Heart Institute for Social Collective Research, I, the IGF, IGF, and just that might be of interest for you because there are three, actually three Brazilian institutions we do cooperation with. Um, I think where it's Fazas, um, for example, and um, Emrati, and I'm not sure what the third one, but there's, uh, there are three Brazilian institutions we do cooperation with and we do cooperative um, projects with, so that might be of interest for you. I can send the information later on. Um, the IGF is specially focused on small and medium enterprises, brings together, together groups of small and medium enterprises which have, you know, the same challenges to, go, uh, to cope with and um, then set up new research projects to help them to cope with the challenges. For example, uh, once again, um, projects related to IoT, digitization, climate change, climate action, and stuff like this. Um, and which is important, each project must have it clearly and, you know, um, crystal clear um, demonstrated that it has an added value not only for one company, but for a total given industry sector. So it's like there are spillover effects not only for a company or a bunch of companies or small medium enterprises, but also for a total um, sector of industry. And now the ARS comes into play. This research is, you know, conducted, it's, you know, um, it's, you know, pre-competitively um, focused and managed exclusively by the industrial associations of the AIF. So they choose the project, they are in contact with the companies, with the small and medium enterprises, and therefore they guarantee that projects are funded which are of relevance for the companies and the small and medium enterprises. Yeah, and it, it's funded, the, um, it's funded uh, or co-funded by the German School of Economic Affairs and Climate Action, which is um, also a very good thing. Yeah, so, well, once again, um, that is a very, um, I don't want to go into too, too much details, it's a very attractive um, scheme, you know, to get into projects, especially as, um, for small and medium enterprises. Um, and it's really, you know, technology transfer orientated, so there's a lot of diffusion of innovations into the different areas of German industry. And um, here are some, you know, my fields of activities or research, for example, technical tools like you know, databases, you know, when it comes to materials, circular economy, and stuff like this, environmental solutions, everything which is related to, for example, you know, setting emissions, you know, getting rid of dangerous substances and, and supplement them, or even um, general industry demand, for example, like, you know, IoT topics or, you know, um, um, augmented reality and production, and also process technologies like, for example, um, alternative technical or better alternative technical solutions for uh, a production technology or stuff like this. So. Yeah, you see, it's um, pretty cool. So right now we have um, 1,867 projects running. Um, uh, new projects, 500 new projects coming uh, coming this year, um, and we have um, maybe 25,000 companies involved and staff um, and companies involved have projects are 13. So it's really you know um, a program which goes or the air uh, goes into a growth scheme, and um, the impact is not focused only on one company. It's focused on, I would say, the um, yeah, more or less total um, scope of industry in Germany. Why is it important for Brazil? We have an international uh, branch of the AIF, uh, of the IGF, which is called Cornet. And once again, Brazil is a partner of Cornet. There are three institutions or three um, associations in Brazil, Fazek and Rati, and the third one, which are partner of Cornet. So it's um, possible to conduct collective research projects between Germany, German institutions, German companies, and Brazilian companies and institutions. And there are two calls uh, per year, so I really invite you to, you know, keep an open, keep an open eye for that. Um, and I'll give you, I will give you gladly the information how to join for it or how to get in contact with the Brazilian institutions. Uh, and then it's the easiest way to do research innovation uh, funded by the public or by the government um, with Germany and German companies. Yeah, some uh, examples for projects, for example, biotechnology, medicine, uh, this was an um, IGF project, um, textiles used, you know, as implants um, for organs, which is a really huge deal because uh, they are much more reliable 
then other forms of implants. Um, another one is lightweight that brought from the um, um, that brought from from uh, German version of Chuck Tank tank um, presented a technology from the IGF which um, makes uh, it 40 to 50 percent more light to produce chips, airplanes, and cars, and therefore, of course, they don't need that much fuel or energy, which is uh, kind of a game changer when it comes to climate action or climate uh, climate change, because you can, you know, carry out more load. Um, for example, on a ship, um, you use less fuel, and it's way more um, energy efficient and climate efficient. Yeah, and then the Eurator has, and the Eurator has come to play. Um, what we have done is with the Eurator net, like it, we have created like a digital print of all that what is happening in the IAF network, where you find you know all the um, experts, all the research associations, companies, startups, uh, researchers from the IAF connected. Um, that is like the easy point, a digital easy point of entry of the IAF world of innovation. We have more than 1,500 innovators directly linked to the innovators net from industry, startups, small and medium enterprises, research institutions, um, sorry for the missing E there, um, directly, and more than 15,000 innovators which are, you know, linked to the AI innovators net via partners like, you know, Fraunhofer, like DIN, like uh, huge companies and stuff like this. You find uh, the rock selling and neutral information because the AIF is, um, what is called gemeinnützig, a non-profit uh, in Germany, um, mutual information and new funding programs and schemes from the AIF or from the German industries, um, cutting edge technologies, information cutting edge technologies, use cases for industries, and small and medium enterprises can save up to 50,000 euros per year by participating in the program because they it don't have high cost, for example, for, you know, getting consultancy on funding programs or uh, on how to use the funding programs and um, so it's also, you know, like the network of the AIF is one of the kind, as I mentioned, the digital version, the digital twin is also like one of the kind because you have the whole system, the whole expertise, the whole, you know, knowledge of the AIF always at your hands in your smartphone, which is pretty cool, or in, you know, other places um, with different functions and tools. I don't want to go into much uh, into detail. There is also some English, you know, uh, English speaking or English language content in the Arab Innovators Net. For example, we do information on Cornet, for example, how to participate in Cornet. And therefore, if you're interested, you know, in getting in contact with us or getting in contact with German industry, with the companies, feel free to contact me via LinkedIn, via mail, and I will, uh, we will check if we can get you access to the network. Um, especially if you are um, interested in doing um, innovations together with German partners of IIF. Yeah, so feel free to uh, stay in contact. I would, um, as my colleague who is doing the, um, uh, who's, you know, responsible for um, everything related to research, innovation, or just get in contact with me or via May, via LinkedIn, or whatever you like. And if you're interested to, you know, get into contact with the AIF or say, okay, that might be of interest to join um, one of the funding schemes of AIF, one of the international programs, feel free to contact me, feel free to um, get in contact with me or my team. Maybe we can incorporate you or give you access to the AIF and Waiters Net, although most of the, what's happening there is in German language, of course, because not in, 99% of the companies are from Germany. We also do have international uh, international, uh, international partners uh, involved there. Yeah, so that's what the AIF is doing. Um, to sum up, innovation in Germany is not only happening in the huge cities and universities, but also very much uh, in industry and small and medium enterprises, the so-called and champions. Um, the AIF is maybe the world's largest network of um, innovative small and medium enterprises and um, non-public research institutions. Um, and it, it is, you know, um, maybe also was also the first pro uh, public private partnership in Europe. Um, and the AIF Innovators Net is the digital easy point of entry to the AIF um, in the world of innovation. And um, yeah, feel free to get in contact with us if you're interested in cooperating with the AIF or participating in the international program. And I will gladly give uh, the, the colleagues um, of the German Innovation House the information on the international programs um, next week when I'm back for my high vacation. <laughs> okay.
<laughs> so thank you very much, Jan. Um, I will ask you if you have a question to Jan Fema to ask first. So uh, we can end this part, and then afterwards, if you have uh, questions to Gloria Rose. Does anybody a question about IEF? Okay, thank you. Who has a question? Mark has a question. <laughs> okay, perfect. Hello, Jan. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for participating here in our Innovators Week. Uh, I have a question in order uh, thinking on the Brazilian entrepreneurs that maybe uh, want to come to Germany. Uh, so your webpage is still only on German. Uh, I don't know how long you you think uh, to to make a international site, website for that as well. And uh, if you are uh, the contact person for CoPoint uh, for uh, for foreign entrepreneurs that want to uh, invest to in to, work, to to invest in, in Germany to come to, with their startups to Germany as well. Yeah, thanks a lot for the question. Um, there is an English version of the AIF web page. I just dropped the link here in the chat, so I can send it on later. There is all the information on the different um, on the different programs I mentioned and all the different things which, uh, which is happening in the AIF right now. So feel free to use it as a kind of resource. Center, if you want to, like here, for example, you see there's a whole bunch of information, a uh, whole bunch of information available in English. You know, not all the different programs I mentioned, all the different, you know, um, you know, contact you need to get in contact with people, and also, you know, on what the app is doing. So there is an English version, and it's yeah, it's not, it's pretty, you know. Uh, it's pretty pretty a huge pile of information you find there. Um, from for the AF Innovators Net, um, there is no English version right now because, to be honest, um, to be honest, we are focused mainly well on the DAF. Because we um, <laughs> we're still trying to get all the 25 companies from Germany in the network. Um, but feel free to contact me or call uh, my colleagues. There is an international team from the AIF which are uh, encompassed of five colleagues doing nothing else than. Uh, fostering and um, getting in contact with international cooperating partners and um, feel free to contact me directly or the colleagues of the international team of the AIF and those are the people like you asked um, which are the right people to um, also give you more uh, insights and also help you to set up for example international projects or how to you know join international projects yeah and if there's a company or startup which wants to come to Germany Feel free to contact me because when it comes to companies, especially small and medium enterprises or startups, I'm the right person to you know get in contact with. And um, we do, we are working right now on an English-speaking version of the AIF Innovator Set, which is no problem because but still, most of the content, to be honest, will be still in German because it's the content comes from the different companies, from the different AIF branches, and it, it is. Still, the working language in Germany, especially for the uh, small and medium enterprises. But yeah, so maybe that might have helped for you. I will send you uh, later on, uh, next week when I'm back in office. I will send you all the information you need on the English, you know, program. Uh, there's a whole bunch of information. And if you, we do have two startups from Brazil in our network, which are part of the AI Innovators Net actually, and one of them moved to Colombo. Um, I think four months ago, and is in contact with the AIF network. So yeah, we also helped him a little bit to you know getting contact with industry in Germany. So if there's somebody of you thinking about setting up a business or do you have an innovative solution which might be of interest for the German industry, just contact us, and I will or my team will gladly help you to get in contact. And what we do, for example, is so-called member talk um, on English for German industry, where we you know get Startups from the international area, from Brazil, from the, from the United States, 
the opportunity to present themselves to the um, IIF network and that in English, so that now you know need to keep it on German first. Thank you very much for your participation. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And uh, if there is no second question for Jan, then uh, I would say we end this part and I would invite Gloria Rose to come. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye. 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 Anyone have a question for Gloria? <laughs> Your okay. presentation clarified everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah, then just another invitation to have a look at our site. And we also have a newsletter. So if you're studying German, maybe you want to follow our articles about the Brazilian economy in German. <laughs> and. Uh, um, if you are just interested in how the German economy is fun functioning, how the conjunction, how the uh, structure of the German businesses are, in, uh, then you can access all the English and speaking information that you will find on our page. So, so I have a question. Too. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> so, Gloria, uh, as we know, we, we are in Brazil uh, in an economic uh, crisis. Uh, there, then we had pandemic and so on. Uh, how you see uh, the perspectives for the short and medium, middle uh, time um, for the development of the economic for business in Brazil, especially for new ones that they want to start in this scenario? Yeah. A very good question. Um, are you only thinking about startups or are you talking about German enterprises as a whole, as all small, medium sized enterprises? Every Especially for startups from Brazil and from Germany that want to come to okay. Brazil. Okay. Well, um, I think that uh, the right now the, the development of the um, yeah. Uh, the global economy is showing a huge drive towards digitalization because of the pandemic, but, but now after the pandemic, it's, this drive will continue, especially because of uh, the necessity that we have to um, speed up uh, the energy transition, transition in a vet much harder environment. It's dif more difficult in order to finance this transition so that we have to live with uh, um, scarcer resources and uh, we have to rely on in innovation much more. So I'm very positive about the chances that uh, Brazilian companies will find in Germany and German companies will find in Brazil. And I also see that especially this area, Brazil, Germany, um, will have a new push. Um, there's more interest from German companies to go to Brazil and um, Brazilian companies, companies, I'm not so sure if they are more, more interested right now to go to Germany. I think Brazilian companies are finding probably also other um, places uh, interesting, maybe China, maybe Asian companies. But on the other side, there's this uh, very strong community between Germany and Brazil, which is facilitating uh, this movement to go abroad. And I'm hoping for a stronger exchange between the two cultures in the future. And since there's more interest now in Germany to cooperate with Brazil, um, I see that this might also bring more Brazilian uh, startups to consider investments in Germany and Europe as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, everybody. Okay, now. Now we will follow Professor Eduardo Zanko uh, to visit the co-working space and the future factory here for industry 4.0 industry. Uh, downstairs, it's on the way to the Sweden restaurant and we will have to be back here shortly before 2 o'clock because from 2 to 3 p.m. 
Uh, there is coming Professor Leonardo from FEA USP to give you a training on pitches. Okay?